Sounds good. All right, um, I'm going to assume everyone can see my screen. And yeah, we can get started. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about some MOS virus spectroscopy. Um, before I go into that, I think there's a little bit of background information that we need to cover in nuclear spin quantum numbers. And I'm not going to go into like the quantum mechanics of it all, just kind of get good. I'm just going to give you some definitions. Um, so every nucleus, um, they all have angular momentum and they're quantized in these nuclear spin um, quantum numbers, um, where the, the main one, nuclear spin angular momentum, is designated by this I. Um, and then this angular momentum is a vector, so it has a magnitude and a direction given by L and M sub I. Um, and the one that we care a lot about in, say, NMR and in MOSFAR is this M sub I, which is your magnetic spin quantum number. Um, that takes values all the way from minus i to positive i um, in steps of one. And so in NMR, we care a lot about the population differences of these m sub i states um, under a magnetic field. So say over here, um, this is sort of like a little schematic plot of energy versus magnetic field, um, which is very useful in NMR, um, kind of gives you an idea of like the Zeeman interaction. This is all stuff that Reynald will go into, I'm sure, in his NMR lecture later on. Um, but generally, these m sub i states are all degenerate with no applied magnetic field, and then they start to split in energy with some being more energetically favorable than others. And so in NMR, we care a lot about these population differences. So say how many like nuclear spins you have in like one state versus the other. Whereas in MOSFET, it's a little bit different. Um, instead, we care about the actual like transitions um, that you can have between your different m sub i states, as well as your like i states going from say your ground i state. So say um, a state of one half and essentially going up to a state of three halves if you're excited. And so these have to follow these selection rules um, where your i state can't change more than plus or minus one. And similarly, your m sub i state can't change more than plus or minus zero or one. And so why I'm explaining all this will kind of become clear later on, but I just want to get this out of the way to begin with. Okay, so to actually MOSFET spectroscopy, it's really rooted in this MOSFET effect, um, which is the nearly recoil free emission and absorption of gamma rays. And I'll sort of like break that down in the next couple of slides. Uh, but just for a little bit of context, um, this effect wasn't discovered until 1958 by Rudolf MOSFET uh, with the picture of him shown over here. And he discovered this at a very young age and reserved and um, earned the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1961 at only the age of 32. Um, and so mass virus spectroscopy, you also hear it referred to as nuclear gamma resonance spectroscopy. Um, generally, um, this is because we use gamma rays um, in order to make, and we use gamma rays in mass virus spectroscopy um, in order to achieve nuclear resonance conditions. Um, and so, yes, we use these high energy gamma rays to detect very, very small chain changes in chemical environments and local magnetic fields in a nucleus that we're interested in studying. Um, and so this is a sort of like typical um, mass virus spectrum that you could see. Um, this is one that I attained here at UCSB um, on the mass virus spectroscope in the Menard lab, um, where we see this absorption peak, um, which Using past knowledge, I'll kind of like go into um, past knowledge and theoretical knowledge um, that I'll go into in this talk. Um, you're able to assign this to say a high spin iron three plus ion in an octahedral environment. Um, and so this will all become clear later on. So now to really break down what this MOSFET effect is. So to achieve this, um, to achieve like a MOSFET effect, you need to use gamma rays, um, which these are literally just very, very, very high energy photons, um, pretty much on the like highest energy side of our electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and generally it's defined that these gamma rays are emitted by a nucleus. Um, I will note that recently synchrotrons have become very, very advanced. Um, so now like X-rays, which is what you, um, most synchrotrons produce, um, they can reach energies up to sort of like the gamma ray, gamma ray energy. Um, and so, what I'll sort of talk about mainly today is how we would do mass spectroscopy in sort of like a purist using actually like gamma rays that are emitted by a nucleus that undergoes radioactive decay. 
Um, but you can achieve similar effects with synchrotrons using just x-rays that are accelerated. Okay, and so these gamma rays, um, whenever they're emitted from a nucleus through a radioactive decay process, um, they take a lot of energy out and these photons have a momentum. And so this means due to the conservation of momentum that there's a sort of recoil effect of your nucleus itself um, that has an energy that can be shown um, to be equal to the energy of the photon squared over two times the mass times the speed of light squared. And so in a um, MOSFET experiment, um, say you're going to emit your gamma ray and it has an energy shown such as this. Um, whenever it is emitted, it's going to be shifted by this recoil energy um, to a lower energy. And similarly, whenever, say, it's absorbed by whatever like material that you're trying to study, it is then also going to shift positively by this recoil energy. So this is going to create sort of like an energy difference of two times this recoil energy, um, which I'm showing over here some sort of like standard values, um, say for um, the gamma ray energy, the recoil energy, and also this large gamma sub naught, which is our line width. Um, and these are all for sort of like 57 iron, which is kind of like the standard main nucleus for MOSFET. Um, and so this line width, all this really means is sort of like the natural sort of like spread of energies that you're going to obtain um, from your gamma ray. And so generally this line width is very, very small on the skip order of 10 to the minus 9th EV. And these recoil energies are on the order of 10 to the minus 3rd EV. Um, so in a typical, um, typically just like this, um, you're not gonna get much overlap of your energies and therefore you're not gonna be able to achieve resonance. Um, and so therefore you wanna be able to get much signal or any signal um, from your MOSFET experiment. And so fortunately um, in solid materials, um, effectively the mass of your entire system, um, well, the mass that is would be used to calculate this recoil energy is effectively the mass of the entire material rather than just say like a single atom. And so this recoil energy decreases dramatically um, from say if it was just like a gaseous system of atoms. So therefore the recoil energy becomes very, very small. Um, and so you get much more overlap of these two conditions, um, therefore enabling you to have recoilless emission, um, which is effectively the MOSFET effect. So this is a very fundamental like principle of MOSFET spectroscopy. Um, and so before I move on, does anyone have any questions on this? I have a I have a quick question with respect to why you can consider it as the um, the mass of the entire material rather than just the mass of the single atom. Is it <laughs> is it is it related to basically bonds holding that nucleus in place? Yes, um, that's a very like key part of it because yeah, say whenever you have a like gamma ray, let's say going in to the solid material. Um, it's going to like hit your atom, but it's not going to cause the atom to like move around too much because yeah, the atom is being held in place by this whole lattice of materials. Um, I will say there is like some interesting sort of like physics involved in like say um, your gamma ray comes in, it causes some like lattice vibrations, um, which can kind of like affect your mass power spectro spectra. Yeah, mass power spectra. Um, and they can kind of like capture like what percent of your um, absorption and emission is recoilless, and they put that in sort of like a mass power factor. I see, I see. Interesting. It, so it's not always perfect. Um, there is still like some like sort of energy loss, um, but in this large actual like solid material, it's much much smaller than say in like a gaseous system. I see. It's also interesting that you would cause lattice vibrations, which I would imagine would be exceedingly lower in frequency relative to a gamma ray, but yeah. Um, but yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Any other questions? Can you clarify what you mean by recoil? <laughs> yes, um, so all photons, um, they have a certain, certain like energy, but they also have a momentum associated with it. And if the energy of your um, gamma ray is very high, it's gonna also have a very high momentum. And say if you just have like a like isolated atom and it emits a um, 
it emits a gamma ray, it's going to have to like compensate for the momentum that it's losing. Um, and so due to the like conservation momentum, it's going to have a sort of like recoil of the atom itself um, that's going to cause it to like shift about and change the overall like energy that's going out with your gamma ray. Okay, and I actually have like a kind of like fun little figure I saw yesterday whenever I was making this. Uh, let's see. Next slide. Um, that sort of like talks about the impact of free quantum absorption and emission of gamma rays. Um, then it's sort of like a graphical sense um, where say if we are just looking, um, it was funny, they called this guy Mr. Gamma because you can see the little gamma. Um, but say if you're in like a system that's not really like held in place, say this guy jumping from this boat to this island, um, whenever he jumps, it's going, the boat's going to like move away and he's going to like move back. And so he won't be able to necessarily jump onto this island. Um, whereas say if you have a lot of like thermal agitation, um, and so there's like this swell effectively is what they're trying to define here. Um, there is a small chance that he'll still be able to like jump onto this other island or boat. Um, so the increase in the emission absorption energy overlap does increase. Um, but then if it's a frozen lake instead, um, these are two like held in place, like starting area and ending area that he's like trying to jump between. Um, like you would have in your like crystalline solid material. And so there's not going to be this as much of like a recoil, um, recoil move. And so you're going to get more like definite overlap of it all. Uh, what can you describe the atomistic model for the, the B option? Yes. Yeah. So in this like top one, it's sort of like just like I've been talking about before, just like a isolated atom where gamma ray goes out, um, the atom recoils back and like moves back and with this energy E sub R. Um, whereas in this like B1, um, this is sort of like if there's like thermal motion happening, um, it's going to move like every which way with like not like a set direction of this momentum. And then in the bottom, this is sort of like typical like um, ball and spring model for a like two atoms and their bonds. And so the gamma ray goes out, but this atom is rigidly held in place by like a series of bonds with like coordinating atoms. So it's not going to recoil. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to move on then. Um, and so if we actually look at how like the experiment is actually done, um, sort of like how it works is you have your source, your absorber, and your detector. Um, where your source and your absorber, absorber, they have to be the same isotope um, because we are really trying, dealing with like very like narrow energy ranges. Um, and so if we're wanting to like excite um, like an iron from like a um, I equals one half to I equals three half, we kind of need the same like transition to occur in the source, but going from three halves to one half. Um, to emit like a gamma ray with the correct energy range. Um, and so we have the source that's moving back and forth different directions um, uh, with set velocities. Um, and it's kind of being modulated in energy by a Doppler effect um, in like a pretty like small energy range, usually on the order of like 500 nano EV. Um, and so that creates your spread of like energies that you're putting in, even though you're using like a set sort of um, gamma ray. And then that gamma ray is sent to the absorber, which is like your sample material. Um, and the like outgoing um, gamma rays are then detected. And it's able to um, detect the different uh, energies, but it measures it in velocity, just like a typical unit that's used in MOS power. Um, it measures the energy of absorption um, within your sample material. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what actual transitions are occurring in your material. And normally the x-axis for MOS power is millimeters per second because um, it kind of like goes back to like the source moving back and forth. Um, that's how they get to the sort of like weird unit, but it can be translated into an actual energy as well. And so in for iron MOSFET, um, the way that these gamma rays are produced um, is sort of this kind of like 
helps us think about the different like energy states that you're going to be transitioning in between whenever you're actually looking at your spectrum. Um, you start out with um, this radioactive source, uh, 57 cobalt, uh, that has a half-life of 200, about 270 days. Um, it undergoes radioactive decay through this process called electron capture. You don't have to know what that is, um, but radioactive decay um, to this very high energy excited state, uh, 57 iron, um, that has a very short half-life that then decays again. Um, all of these are emitting gamma rays as well in this process. Um, but those are being filtered out until um, here your 57 iron decays again um, to the ground state. Um, now with a spin quantum number of one half. Um, and so this is the gamma ray that's filtered um, in order to be the one that's used for mass power spectroscopy. Because really, whenever we're doing the actual experiments, we're mainly looking um, between transitions from this state to this state. So this gamma ray goes out. And then whenever we have our absorber material, what we're measuring is an excitement from here to here and the energy associated with that. Okay, and so um, as I just said on the previous slide, um, you need to have the same isotope present in both your source and your absorber material. Um, and so that starts to kind of like lead into how mass spectroscopy has very precise requirements that need to be met, um, which kind of limits its applicability. And so the first sort of requirement is you need to have a pretty suitable gamma ray source. Um, so it also needs to have like a very convenient half-life. Um, as well as like you, you being able to source it and all of that, um, um, which I'm showing over here, some like common like gamma ray sources that can be used um, in as well as the mass power active elements. So elements that are able to undergo a like mass power effect and be used in these measurements. Um, and all other ones are unsuitable for mass power. So overall, there's not, you don't have an option to do all of the experiments. Um, you also need to have a pretty low gamma ray energy, which is what kind of prevents some elements from being able to undergo mass power, um, be used for mass power spectroscopy. Um, because if you have very, very high um, gamma ray energies required, um, you're going to start to have issues with like the recoilless emission, because you're gonna start putting in very high energy gamma rays and you're gonna get a lot more like lattice vibrations present. Um, and so typically, the um, nuclei that are looked at for mass power include um, 57 iron, which is what we have here on campus, um, as well as tin, antimony, and iodide. Um, you can do like other experiments as well, um, but those are just much less performed. Um, and overall, you could also probably do these three nucleus, nuclei on campus. Um, you just need to buy your own source material to do those experiments. So before I move on to the next part, let me take some questions. I have a quick question, Emily. Um, how is the source excited? Mm. Um, so the source itself doesn't actually have to be excited at all. Um, the source is a radioactive material. Um, and so over time, um, it will undergo like radioactive decay um, and it'll emit these gamma rays. Okay. Um, and so that's sort of like a requirement on these source materials to have like a convenient half-life, not something like too short or too long. So like then you are getting like actual, like a reasonable amount of gamma rays being emitted per minute, second, all of that. I see. So if I'm, if I'm trying to run some 57 iron MOS power spectroscopy ahead of time, I need to buy some 57 cobalt. Um, and within less than uh, 270 days, probably run my experiments? Um, somewhat. So this is its half-life. So over um, in 270 days, the amount of 57 cobalt will have decreased by half. Yep. So you'll still have like a reasonable amount of um, 57 cobalt to undergo decay. Okay. Um, however, yeah, if you want to have like the most amount of gamma rays going out, um, then yeah, you would want to use it as soon as possible. Okay. Um, for now, um, the Menard lab does have like the 57 cobalt source. So it's like usable right now. 
you would want to do it. Um, right. But they did recently have to buy a new one a couple of years back, I think. Okay. Okay. So it's every couple of years that you, you would buy a new source. Yeah. And overall they're on the grand scale of science expenses expenses. They're not that bad. I think they're like under 10 K for okay. a source of like 57 cobalt. Okay. So then I am going to move on to sort of what information that you can obtain from Mossbauer um, rather than talking more about like the principles and like how it's run. And so there's gonna be sort of like three different categories here. There's gonna be it's isomer shift, the quadrupolar splitting and the hyperfine splitting. And these are all like sort of parameters that you can get out of your Mossbauer spectra um, and use that to kind of like figure things out about your system. Okay, and so to start off the first um, the isomer shift, it's kind of the most simple one to think about. Um, this is a measure of the electron density around the nucleus. Um, and so let's see, um, in our say source material and our absorbable material, um, as I talked about before, really um, in the source, it's going from an excited I equals three half state, relaxing down to the ground I equals one half state. State, and in that process, it's going to emit this gamma ray. Um, and this gamma ray is then going to be absorbed in the absorbent material and excited from one half up to three halves, which is why we're going to attain the sort of absorption peak itself. Um, but very likely, um, the specific, specific um, like gamma ray energy that's going to be required for this absorption of it is not going to be the same as it was in your source material. Um, and so therefore, it's going to be like modified slightly in energy. Um, and so you're, it's going to appear at say higher um, energies and it's gonna be shifted away from zero, which is sort of like the set point for your reference by this little Delta, which we call our isomer shift or a chemical shift. Um, and I'll, I should note that in general um, for iron moss power, most commonly alpha iron is used as a, as a reference. Um, so essentially you're just like taking the spectrum that you get and you just put in this reference of alpha iron and set that to zero. Um, and so this uh, little delta is going to be really dependent on um, the Coulombic interaction between the electron density at the nucleus of your absorbent material. Um, so these are really going to mainly be like S electrons because those are the only electrons like at the nucleus. Um, so the interaction between those and the sort of surrounding electron density of your nucleus. Um, so most often we could be thinking about like the P and D electrons as well as sort of like what the bonding environment is like. Um, and so um, typically um, there's a lot of like sort of like calculations you can run to sort of understand what this electron density at the nucleus is. And actually um, somewhat working with Aryan to kind of like figure out how to do this in our lab as well. Um, but broadly the trend that's seen is that the isomer shifts for say like higher oxidation states of iron are going to be closer to zero than the ones at, at um, lower oxidation states. Um, so our iron four plus will be around here, then three plus, then two plus. Um, and this is because like the larger D electron density acts to sort of like repel um, the S electron density and that'll like increase the like, S electron density at the nucleus itself. Okay, and also here, stop me if you have questions. So I'm about to move to like a different sort of topic. Yeah, I had a question. So yeah. how does how does this information differ from the sort of chemical shift information you'd get from NMR? Yeah, great question, because I'm using effectively the same terminology as you would in NMR. Um, yes, so they're very closely related because in NMR effectively you're looking also at like the sort of change in the electron density at the nucleus. Um, here it's sort of different because we're looking at different like energy um, energy scales, um, because like I like had previously mentioned um, in NMR, we're really just looking at the population differences between different like M sub I, I quantum states. Whereas here we're looking at um, like actual like energy transitions between these different I states. And so that's going to give you a lot more resolution in terms of like the like small energy differences between all of these. Um, but it's also going to generally require 
um, a little bit more of like advanced like setup to get all these like energies correct. Um, and so similar information, because also from your chemical shift in NMR, you're also looking at the local environment, um, but sort of like different principles. Um, one, one other thing to consider here too, is that, um, some nuclei are really hard to look at with NMR. Um, and so using MOS Bauer is a way to sort of get that same kind of information that you would get from NMR, um, without being constrained by the same sort of like paramagnetic, um, complications, uh, that will arise from NMR. Something that I think is like really interesting is that in my research, I work on sodium iron fluorine um, containing electrode materials. And both sodium and fluorine are pretty good to look at with NMR, um, but you can't ever do NMR on um, iron um, for a number of reasons, but we can do mass bar on it. So we sort of have like multiple tools to look at the local environments of the atoms in my materials, which I think is like a really cool idea to be able to look at that for all of the elements. Okay, so this is the isomer shift. Um, and so I'm gonna move on to now the quadrupolar shift or quadrupolar splitting, I should say. Um, and so the quadrupolar splitting, um, you can also like think of how it may be related to NMR, um, but to not go there. Um, so it's related to the symmetry of our nuclear environment. Um, so say if you're a nucleus um, that has this like set sort of like, um, angular momentum, um, it's in this, the presence of this electric field gradient. Um, if it has an I state greater than a half, um, the N sub I states will then be split um, with by either zero or one. Um, so here, and say iron, for what this is drawn from, um, our ground state I equals one half, this won't be split at all, um, but the excited state I equals three halves, that'll be split then into um, plus and minus three halves and plus and minus one half. And I'll note that these states are still degenerate. Um, these two are. And so then in, in our never do mass virus spectroscopy, there's two different um, sort of transitions that occur, either from this state to here or this state all the way up to here. Um, and so that's going to give us two different absorption events. And the sort of splitting between um, these two absorption dips is going to be this delta EQ, which we call our quadrupolar splitting. Um, and so the magnitude of this and also like whether it occurs at all um, can all give you information on sort of like the oxidation state, the spin state, as well as like the local symmetry and coordination. Because these are all going to really play into whether you have an electric field gradient in the first place and also what sort of like the magnitude of it may be. Um, and so a nice example of this is say if you're looking at like high spin iron 2 plus, which has an electron core um, configuration of 3d6 versus high spin 3 plus high spin iron three plus, um, which is just 3D5. Um, so all of the D orbitals for iron three plus are gonna be very equally occupied by electrons because there's five orbitals. And so that's gonna have a very symmetric environment. Whereas for iron two plus, um, it's going to have an extra electron in an orbital. And so therefore there's going to be this quadrupolar splitting that's gonna occur. Um, and so, in every material, um, there's going to be at least definitely an isomer shift. Um, there may be a quadrupolar splitting. Um, so those are kind of like the two most common ones to observe. Um, and then the last sort of, go ahead, Elias. Uh, can you explain again why you would get um, this quadrupolar splitting from the, the D6 versus the D5? Yes. Um, so for um, the d orbitals, there's five overall orbitals. Um, and so for, um, say, if we have like a d5 iron 3 plus, um, there's going to be an electron then in every single orbital. Um, and then instead, if we are looking at something that's d6, um, it's now going to have like one extra electron um, that's going to have to go in a different orbital. Um, and so that's going to create a electric field gradient at our nucleus. Because you've got an extra electron and yeah, in one area. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Whereas say if you're looking at like low spin iron two plus. Um, so now there's going to be six total electrons in like the 
three lowest energy D orbitals, which are our T2G orbitals. Um, these are each going to now have two electrons in them. Um, and so that's going to effectively create a um, homogeneous electric field um, for our nucleus. And therefore, we're not going to observe quadrupolar splitting for um, low spin iron 2 plus. So then the last main piece of information that can be taken from Ospauer um, is this hyperfine splitting. Um, and this is only present whenever there is some sort of magnetic field present, um, be it like an internal local magnetic field um, that's being created by like nearby atoms or actually just an applied magnetic field. And so now if we look again at sort of like our energy diagram, um, all of those M sub I states I had previously talked about, um, those were all like doubly degenerate, having both their positive and negative components. But now in the presence of this magnetic field, um, these are going to start being split. Um, and so now there's going to be many, many more transitions that can occur, um, but they have to still obey um, these selection rules. Um, and so there's actually only going to be six different transitions that can occur all with like different like probabilities of occurring, which is going to give us a very rather complicated um, spectrum, um, but it'll always give you for iron a sextet sort of spectrum, because um, there are six different transitions that can occur. So this splitting here is very analogous to um, how like what NMR is based on. Um, so for example, this is really what you'd be looking at for NMR. Um, but now we're also including um, the excited I equals three half state. And so that's how we, we have so many more of these transitions. Um, and if you modify how you're running your experiments, maybe like with single crystals or powders or different like applied fields and temperatures um, and orientations as well, um, you can parse out a lot of different components um, of sort of like magnetic fields that your nucleus can be um, experiencing. And I won't go like very far into this, but this has a very like rich history in physics. Um, it can give you a lot of like really awesome information that would be very difficult to get otherwise, at least from like a truly experimental standpoint. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, and then so just to sort of sum all of this up, this is my last slide. Um, Mossbauer spectroscopy is a really powerful tool to study the local environment of a select few nuclei. Um, and by and large, um, most of the literature is on um, iron Mossbauer, and that's what we very easily can do here at ECSB. Um, however, I would note that you could probably do a few other nuclei, but you would have to buy your own source material. Um, and so with Mossbauer, there's really like these three main measurables, your isomer shift, quadrupolar splitting and hyperfine splitting. And these can all give you like really powerful information um, on the oxidation state, spin state, local coordination, and local magnetic field. Um, you just have to sort of look at it and start to like compare it with what you've seen in the literature and what sort of like makes sense theoretically. Um, and from there you can start to be like, okay, I have say this iron two plus in this sort of like coordination environment. Um, and so it's very powerful there. And one thing I also didn't mention is that it's a entirely quantitative technique. And so you're going to be observing all of the iron in your material. So say for battery materials, it's wonderful because um, a lot of times you care a lot about what sort of like redox is occurring in your material. So you can truly like quantify it, like this percent of iron is going to like this state. Um, so it's overall a very powerful technique that if you have iron in your system, I would highly recommend looking into it. And so with that, um, thanks for listening and I'd be happy to take any further questions. Thank you, Emily. Um, questions, anybody? I have one more question, a uh, great talk, Emily. So um, if you use a synchrotron, a synchrotron to generate these high energy X-rays or gamma rays that you need for MOSBAR, does that open up what sort of samples you can measure? Cause you don't need like a specific generating isotope anymore? Yes, so I'm gonna go back to this slide. Great question. Um, and so question is about if you're at a synchrotron rather than being based on like using sort of like radioactive source materials, can you like uh, 
perform a lot more experiments on like different nuclei? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, so you'll no longer be limited to having to have like a suitable gamma ray source because you'll be able to like tune the energy of your X-ray to the correct um, energy. However, the caveat is there's still like some elements that aren't suitable for mass power for like a number of reasons. And so those are still going to be like unusable in mass power. Uh, but say if you wanted to look at mass power of like rhenium, you could go to a synchrotron and do that. Thanks. Um, Emily, in your uh, research, what have you used Moss Bauer to better understand? Yes. Um, so in my research, let's see, this is a spectra that I've actually like obtained in my research. Um, so I was looking at um, this material that started out um, it, as a high spin iron three plus, um, and then would undergo sort of a conversion reaction to iron zero. And so in my research, I've used mass power to really like look at that transition and see like what happens um, in the initial material and what else then occurs in like the discharge and charge and like sort of try to quantify how much of my iron is actually undergoing this conversion. I'll note that there are like sort of some complications with the actual material itself, but like theoretically the mass power should have been like totally able to say like we are getting like 50% conversion of our material to iron zero. I see. And this is information, again, that you would not have been able to, to really probe with NMR, even though you're sort of looking at similar transitions. Correct. Yeah. This is information that's all specific to what's happening to iron, um, whereas in NMR, that's not something that we're able to observe. We're kind of having to sort of back calculate like what we see, say, with like sodium NMR, to like what we might expect the iron to be doing. Um, which it's always better if you have a good technique that like directly probes what you're wanting to understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, Moss Bauer is is just sort of a an extension of NMR in 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 the sense that you're really doing nuclear spectroscopy. Um, I would say they fall under the same sort of like umbrella of nuclear spectroscopy, but then they sort of like branch out into their two areas. So there's sort of like different physics happening. Are there um, are there Moss Bauer experiments that are run under an applied magnetic field? Definitely. Um, and that's something that I sort of like thought about trying out myself. Um, although I believe, yeah, the Moss Bauer and the Menard lab, it does not have functionality right now um, in order to like apply a magnetic field, but they can go down to like 90 Kelvin. Um, and so, Say if you're looking at material that you think like should like undergo a transition um, at like a certain temperature or certain magnetic field, you can apply that and then take a mass power spectrum and sort of see like what's happened to it. And like, are we now getting like an iron in a totally different coordination environment or what? I see, I see, cool. Yeah, it's a nice like marriage, I think of like magnetometry and mass power at times. Yeah, very cool. Any other questions? Okay. If not, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Still happy to talk. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop.